Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for being here this evening at the East Hampton Library. Tonight, we have Stephen Rosen. We're going to see uh, an excellent presentation on cosmic radiation. And just a little bit about Stephen. Uh, Stephen Rosen learned relatively, rel relatively from Professor Banish Hoffman, a colleague, collaborator, and biographer of Albert Einstein. And his popular talks on relativity are based on albertinesteinreturns.com. That's the website uh, you could go to, to to find out more about that. Uh, at the Institut d'Astrophysique in Paris and Centre d'Etudes Nucléaires in Saclay, he was a visiting scientist working on nuclear astrophysics and cosmic radiation. At Los Alamos National Laboratory, and a prominent think tank during the Cold War. He addressed issues of national defense and science policy. At Glasnost and uh, Perestroika, he helped 400 Russian emer emerge science from the Soviet Union find employment in their specialties in the US. He was honored for this robust aging and for his publication and other public service activities by the Forward and the Weschler Center for Aging. Uh, Dr. Rosen's articles have appeared in science journals, Physical Review, uh, Nature, Nuevo Cimiento. Uh, his opt-eds and popular essays appear in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the East Hampton Star. His best-selling book, Future Facts, is listed as one of the 100 most important books of the 20th century. And sidebar, there are copies at the East Hampton Library to check out. Nobel laureate Ronald Roald Hoffman said his book, Career Renewal, co-authored with his wife, Celia Paul, is the ultimate self-help manual for the intelligent job seeker. And Albert Einstein sings the great American songbook as the title of his current project, it's a musical about Einstein and relativity. And without further ado, here's Dr. Stephen Rosen. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Bob Caro quoted uh, Lyndon Johnson when he was given a uh, fulsome introduction like that. And he, he said, my father would have loved it and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> Cosmic rays are energetic, charged nuclear particles that are ejected by supernova in our galaxy and in distant galaxies. And they, once they're ejected from a supernova, they travel through interstellar and intergalactic space, and they, some of them find their way to the Earth. Albert Einstein said that I'm not smarter than anyone else. He actually said this. He said, I just stay with the problem longer. And uh, I like that quote. And I've been staying with a problem a very long time. And 60 years ago, I wrote a doctoral dissertation on cosmic radiation. And I've stayed with the problem for 60 years. These are the topics we're going to talk about today. Egyptian pyramids, volcanoes, DNA, lighting, lightning, smartphones, climate change, and relativity. Um, and I'm going to ask your participation in a moment in a very strange way. We'll come right back to this. But meanwhile, this is the Reader's Digest version of my talk in cartoon form. The upper half of the slide, the blue stuff, is interstellar space, and the white lines are cosmic ray protons, the called primary cosmic ray beam, the ones that come from the supernova. The lower half of the slide, the white space with the blue lines, are called secondary cosmic ray particles because when the primary cosmic ray particles strike the top of the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen nuclei, they produce uh, shrapnel, uh, a, a cascade 
uh, a cosmic ray shower of secondary particles that multiply and find their way to the surface of the Earth where they're detected by specialized detectors. This airplane, flying at 35,000 feet, uh, from New York to Los Angeles and back, if you were on that plane, you would experience an exposure to cosmic radiation the equivalent of one chest X-ray. And But if you're higher, you're higher than that, you're in a space station, you experience much more. And if you go into Mars, you experience much, much more. So they have to take that into account. I'm going to show you a very strange slide which is my idea of the difference between actual, actual and apparent. So the vertical axis is actually smart, actually dumb. The horizontal axis is sounds smart and sounds dumb. Stay with me on this. It will be apparent in a moment what I'm trying to do. So lower left quadrant is actually dumb, sounds dumb. And I think you'll all agree that invading Russia in winter happened twice, and both times it was a failure, was actually dumb and, and sounds dumb. Um, plugging a power strip plug into itself to get free power, actually dumb, sounds dumb. Uh, I actually know somebody who declared embezzled funds as income on their tax return. Sounds dumb, actually dumb. Over here, sounds smart, actually dumb. This is my opinion. Astrology sounds smart, but it's actually dumb in my book. Vampire musicals, Scientology, perpetual motion machine, machines, seances, and the Edsel car. Upper right quadrant, actually smart, sounds smart. Sliced bread, the wheel, Newton, Einstein, Darwin, and when Einstein was asked what was the greatest invention of all time, he said compound interest. Of course, you get something for nothing. Now, I'm going to go back to this, and I'm going to talk about each of these in order. And I'm going to ask you where, which quadrant each of these things that I'm going to talk about should be placed. And there's no wrong answers, except there's my answer. Now, here's the difference between solar radiation and galactic cosmic radiation. As I said, these come from supernova in our galaxy and distant galaxies. And these are high energy protons, positively charged particles that travel through interstellar and intergalactic space on their way to the Earth. Solar radiation, obviously we know, the nine nuclear furnace, 93 million miles away. It gives us heat and light, but it also sends out particles, very low energy particles, much lower than the energy of the supernova generated protons. And when these solar particles get near the earth, they produce aurora borealis at, at, the, at the poles. Here's a close up of, of a supernova remnant, uh, and that after it has exploded, it produces all kinds of stuff, a shock wave. But here's, here's the primary cosmic ray proton, P plus it's called. And that, by the way, that's the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. And there's a lot of hydrogen in, in, in interstellar and intergalactic space. But notice the feature of this proton as it moves through interstellar space and there are magnetic fields that exist in the space. Now, um, a magnetic field will cause a charged particle to change direction. So you don't know which particle came from which supernova, although you do know from light which travels in straight lines from the supernova to Earth, except for uh, a little thing called general relativity where light can be bent by a gravitational object. So gamma rays and light travel straight for the most part. Now, here's a close-up of the shrapnel from the 
incoming cosmic ray primary particle from the supernova. And when it strikes the top of the atmosphere, it produces this cascade of shower, cosmic ray shower of secondary cosmic rays. Now, physicists like uh, Greek letters, and this is a ga gamma ray, that's radiation, these are electrons. This pi stands for a particle called a pi meson, and for short, they're called pions. So I'm gonna say pi meson or pions, from now on, and you'll know that it's one of the fragments uh, of, of a cosmic ray particle. Now, don't get scared, but this is data that's been collected over maybe a hundred years now. The vertical axis the vertical axis represents the intensity of the cosmic ray beam at the top of our atmosphere. And uh, in other words, the number of particles per square centimeter per second. The horizontal axis represents the energy of the particles that have been detected at that different intensity or called flux. So the low, this is low energy. This is very, very high energy. At low energy, we have the solar particles that I talked about earlier. And at energies starting to get, this is the uh, uh, collider in the, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. That's, it's, it's very, uh, produces very energetic particles. But as you can see, the cosmic ray beam uh, has a, a spectrum that goes even beyond the Large Hadron Collider. And we have reason to believe that these, the, the, the energy of these particles is from our galaxy, supernova exploding in our galaxy. And we have reason to believe that the particles with this amount of energy come from other galaxies, extragalactic. Now I'm going to digress a minute. This is my doctoral dissertation. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, I got five publications out of my one thesis. Um, now we're going to talk about the, the Pyramid of Giza. CAT scans are computerized axial tomography. And if you've been in a hospital and you've been in the cylinder, you notice it makes a lot of noise, but the um, x-rays, the word tomo in Greek means uh, slice or section. So CAT scans are sections of your body that they can examine uh, after they analyze the data. Now, we can x-ray the pyramids with cosmic rays. Instead of using x-rays, we use muons, mu mesons, because those are the secondary particle in the cascade that comes down after being triggered by the primary particle. And these are the, this is the intensity. Now, if you arrange detectors around the base of a pyramid, and detect the cosmic rays that are coming through the pyramid. Guess what? If it was completely solid, you would get one reading from, from all of these detectors around the base. But if there are voids in the pyramids, which are not accessible by any entrance because they buried those uh, Egyptian rulers and they wanted them to be alone on the voyage to the afterlife. If there are voids, the cosmic ray detectors will have a different reading outside of the pyramid because uh, th there's empty space inside that can be interpreted from the data. I'm gonna ask you which quadrant you, would you, you're gonna to have to do some work here. This is, uh, I'm inviting you to participate in. Which quadrant you, would you put, put the um, um, X-raying muon 
tomography of, of the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Lower left, lower right, upper right, upper left. Anybody? Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more because not only that, it's, it's actually smart and it, it, it sounds smart the way I described it. And it is actually smart because they actually got data. So that's definite. I agree with you. So now we're going to go into the next volcanic eruptions. Same idea. Computerized axial tomography, muon um, particles. Oops, I lost my place. Bear with me a moment. So the particles pass through the volcanic molten lava inside. You, you can't go in there. It's too hot. And here I am. And what do they do? Well, The solar wind that comes from the sun carries magnetic fields with it, and the high energy pro primary cosmic ray protons uh, get bent away from the Earth. So when the solar cycles are quiet, the eruptions of the volcanoes are greater. Now, this has been tried, and that's the theory, and they haven't proven yet. It's speculative. So I would put that down maybe in, um, in the lower right quadrant, maybe. It's, it's a nice, it sounds smart, but it, <laughs> we haven't gotten a good result yet. But this is an example of what I'm trying to show you is, is real and imaginary. Now, it turns out that your DNA, uh, your genetic material, is can be affected by cosmic radiation. And in fact, can produce mutations, at least that's the theory. Over the last millions or even billions of years, animals and humans have have been exposed to a bath, an ocean of cosmic ray particles. You can't escape it. There's no place to hide in the universe. It pervades everywhere. There's no control. So the biology professor wife gives birth to a set of twins. And he baptizes one, and he saves the other one as a control. There is a, a thought that right right-handed DNA, which is what all of us are made of, was the result of a co cosmic ray uh, striking the DNA. So I would put where would you put this one? Lower right. Oh, right. Yeah, me too. Me too. You can't prove it, but it makes a lot of sense. It sounds smart, but you can't prove it because you can't shut off the cosmic ray beam and have a control, like in the joke. Now, lightning. If the, these are bullets proton charged particles are like bullets and if they ionize air in a thundercloud they release free electrons that can provide conducting pathways for lightning so they call it greased lightning they have not yet observed this but it's another smart idea that that that's probably not necessary that's speculative let's call it speculative Smartphones. Everybody's got a smartphone. Now that little chip 
in your smartphone that allows you to take photographs, it's sensitive to light, particles of light. But it's also very, very, very vaguely sensitive. One event over 100 years, a very high energy cosmic gray particle from a distant supernova. So uh, 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 physicists came up with this idea. You tell me what you think of it. Suppose we get a million people together with smartphones and we link them together with, with a uh, software system that, that will pool the data and so that we could make a massive cosmic ray detector at home on your kitchen table. So which quadrant? <laughs> lower right, I think lower. It's a great idea, and it sounds great, but it's, but it's, it isn't. Climate change. So there is a correlation uh, between um, cosmic rays and, and the climate, a very, very weak one. And with the fewer the cosmic rays, the warmer the climate. Um, because these cosmic rays create aerosol particles, clusters of, of molecules, and they, they can create clouds that, that make the Earth less warm. The clouds, cloud cover absorbs the sun. Which quadrant? It's all speculative. Lower right, lower right. Relativity. If I hold my hand up to the sky, those secondary particles will pass through my hand. You won't feel it. They're invisible. Uh, Buckminster Fuller said that the greatest discovery of the 20th century was the discovery that the invisible is more important than the visible. And I think he might have been thinking of Freud and Einstein, but maybe he was also thinking of cosmic rays. So you can't see these. But one muon, mu meson, per second passes through your hand. The interesting thing about this is that a muon at rest takes a millionth of a, whoa, a millionth of a second to decay at rest. But there's a strange feature of, of relativity that the an object, a system that's moving very fast, close to the speed of light, time is slower in that system as observed from a stationary system. So guess what? The muons are traveling near the speed of light because the original proton is traveling near the speed of light and it produces the, the shrapnel. And when it's moving very fast near the speed of light, instead of decaying into other particles in a millionth of a second, it decays uh, in, in, a, in a, thousand, a thousandth of a second, about a thousand times slower. What that does is it means that the path of the muon is, is long enough to go through your hand. So by holding your hand up, you're proving general uh, special relativity. Which quadrant? I think the upper right. Yeah, I think it's that's pretty cool, isn't it? And finally, which is, I have to tell you that my t subtitle, um, I forgot what the subtitle is, The Gift That Keeps Giving. Is a, is a misnomer because cosmic radiation mimics aging in people. It causes us to have neurodegenerative disorders and diseases of all sorts. Again, you can't shut it off, so you, you can't do a controlled experiment. But I would say that that makes a gift that keeps on giving uh, a, an erroneous subtitle. It, it should be the punishment that keeps coming. So if you're reaching for a word 
it's entirely possible that you could blame cosmic radiation on it. And I think I'm going to stop here, except for some personal, some personal stuff. And maybe I should stop for some questions. Wait, no. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go back to my dissertation stuff. And um, this, this got me invited to uh, the 14th International Astrophysical Symposium in Liège, Belgium, with my wife and two children four and eight. And so I presented this and there was a very, there were a hundred astrophysicists from all over the world, including one named Tommy Gold, very famous. And he started questioning me after I presented my stuff and I got a little stuck. I wasn't, <laughs> you spend years doing this and you can't answer some simple, I could, I could answer it, but I wasn't happy with the answer. I don't think he was happy with the answer. Why am I telling you this? Later that evening, we're all staying at the same hotel, and my wife and the two kids get in the elevator, and the elevators in Europe are very tiny, some of them, and uh, the elevator stops at a lower floor, and guess who gets in? Tommy Gold. My four-year-old son, who had no knowledge of what happened when I made a presentation and embarrassed myself by not answering Tommy Gold's great questions, says, and I quote exactly to Tommy Gold, hello, stupid. Apropos of nothing. Now, guess what the genius Tommy Gold says to my son? He says, hello, stupid. So on the basis of this, I got invited to, to Paris, the Institut d'Astrophysique back in the 60s. And um, I was there for a year. 60, May Day, 1968. Does anybody remember what happened in May Day, 1968, all over the world? The students were rising up and challenging authority. And in Paris, they had building block, uh, Belgian building blocks, about five or 10 pounds each, and they were pulling them up out of the out of the road and throwing them at the gendarmes who had plastic shields and batons and after the police got tired of this and i happened to observe this accidentally with my editor and we were coming out on place de l'audion and it looked like a movie you know the students were here throwing the building blocks and the cops were there and they 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 started sending tear gas at the at the kids. And we're standing there watching this and it blows our way. And we run down the metro, steps in the metro, and guess what? Tear gas is heavier than air. It has to be or it wouldn't work. So it followed us down. And we had a male bonding experience, which we discuss every year when we meet each other. Yes. I don't know. It, it was uh, something that I could do theoretically. I didn't have to do any experiments for my dissertation. And also there's a certain grandiosity. Uh, it's a big ideas, very big ideas. And I always loved astrophysics. So when I'm asked on jury duty what my specialty is, I say nuclear astrophysics. And I'm never, never taken. <laughs> never taken. So questions, comments? No benefits, uh, except the invitation to spend a year in Paris, which is pretty good. Now you can't make money out of this. This is knowledge. This is pure science. What about them? Oh, well, I didn't, oh, so, so Albert Einstein was my childhood hero. And I wanted to be Einstein. I also wanted to be George Gershwin. Two, two Jews, two geniuses. It never happened. But I went into physics because of Einstein. And I just told us, do you want me to tell that story? So I, about my, oh, I forgot. I forgot, I forgot. Okay, okay. It's a good thing my wife is here. So there's my musical. There's a poster for my musical. 
And I actually have a song queued up, which I'm going to play for you. And this has nothing to do with cosmic radiations. It's just one of my many interests. Um, so here we go. So now, first of all, you have to know that Einstein hated being a celebrity. He was really modest um, and you turn it up. So this is a poem he wrote in German, in Dagro, and we converted it into a song. Let's do it again. Okay. You want to turn up the volume? Wherever I go and wherever I stay, there's always a picture of me on display on top of a desk or out in the hall tied round my neck or hung on the wall sometimes surrounded by all this good cheer I'm puzzled by some of the things that I wonder my mind for a moment not hazy if I and not they could really be crazy so he wrote he actually wrote that in German so we made it into a song thanks so he, he was famously indifferent uh, to fame and there's a story about him he was after he became famous uh, people wanted a piece of him. And he was on a train in Europe and a reporter said, Dr. Einstein, I'd like to interview. He said, I'm not Dr. Einstein. And the guy said, yes, you are. I've seen your picture in the newspapers. And Einstein said, who should know better, you or me? <laughs> I think we'll stop here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, the Zoom audience. Hello to everybody there. Bye-bye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sheila.